Okay, so I will, uh, my, my name is Roland Winter from uh, Dortmund University in uh, Germany. So I will give an introductory lecture about pressure effects on biomolecular systems, right? So this will be <laughs> essentially an educational kind of talk. If you are more interested in details, um, you can listen to my talk on uh, Tuesday morning. So maybe we start off with what, I mean, our solvent in our cells is essentially water. So what is the relevant pressure range? Because we have to stay in the <coughs> fluid-like state. Yeah? So you see here the pressure temperature phase diagram of water. We have to stay here in the liquid state. So if we are here at around <coughs> uh, ambient temperature, you see uh, we have the pressure range, <coughs> which is of relevant up to 10 kilobar, so uh, essentially one GPA. But what is quite interesting here, yeah, you see it's slightly elevated pressures, uh, two, three, four kilobars. Yeah, we can even go below zero degrees centigrade, meaning that we can, for example, study cold denaturation of proteins, which occurs typically at minus 20, minus 10 degrees centigrade. Yeah? So you, you see this is a rather uh, low pressure limit. So <laughs> under these conditions, we have essentially no changes of bond distances, bond angles. Only intermolecular distances are tuned by pressure application. And uh, what is very important for the biological systems, conformational changes um, are occurring. And so first I would like to start off why pressure studies on biomolecular systems. Certainly this is of interest from a biological point of view because you probably heard that already pressure might have an impact on the evolution of life. It might have started in the <coughs> deep sea under uh, rather high pressure conditions actually, like in areas <coughs> shown here in the uh, um, uh, black smoker areas, for example. And in the deep sea, we, you have an average pressure of around 400 bar, and the maximum pressure reached here in the Mariana Trench is about uh, 1 kilobar, yeah? <clears throat> 0.1 GPA. And actually, even under these conditions here, <laughs> you see here a lot of uh, microorganisms thriving. And so the question is, how do these organisms adapt to these hostile conditions of low temperature, high pressure, yeah? So which is actually called homeoviscous adaptation. And for us biophysicists, what does pressure do to biomolecular systems and reactions? Yeah? So in biophysics, we try to understand uh, uh, the pressure effects on biomolecular systems. So for us, important is the <coughs> physical chemistry biophysics uh, aspect. Uh, you know, when you change the pressure, uh, as a very important thermodynamic parameter next to temperature and chemical potential. When you change pressure, you change the volume or density only. When you change temperature, for example, you do both. You change the density and the thermal energy. Yeah. So if you do both, you can dis disentangle between both effects. You need pressure-dependent measurements to gain a full understanding of the st stability uh, of a system, like a phase diagram of a protein. You can study dynamic phase transitions. You can do fast pressure jumps and study the kinetics of biomolecular systems. I will give you an example. You can tune, as I said before, intermolecular interactions in a very controlled way. Pressure, actually, even when you think about kilobars, is a mild perturbating agent, very different from what you do when you change the temperature or add chemicals like urea to denature proteins. Yeah? So it's a mild perturbating agent. As you know already, it affects chemical equilibria and reaction rates. So you, I will come back to that in a minute. You can determine the activation volume and the reaction volume, which gives you additional information. And by pressure, you can increase the occupancy of excited states and then study them thoroughly which could be conformational substates of a protein, folding or aggregation in the medias, so this kind of stuff. Okay, and then there is a technological aspect. <laughs> pressure can be used to inactivate microorganisms. Uh, I don't have to talk about that. High pressure food processing, you, <coughs> uh, you, you, you will hear about that in the talk to follow. And there are quite a number of more technological applications, separation of protein complexes, use of pressure for tuning and enzymatic reactions, 
There are also some medical applications and so on. Yeah? But as I said, for us, is the physical chemical aspect important. So what does pressure do to cells, essentially? Um, so most pressure, or one of the most pressure-sensitive processes, are phase transitions of the lipid membranes. Yeah? I will get back to that later. Then pressure can dissociate proteins. If pressure is high enough, pressure can unfold proteins. Yeah? And um, <clears throat> pressure can change the motility uh, of biomolecular systems. And it's known that pressure also retards the uh, <coughs> production of proteins in the ribosome because the ribosome dissociates under pressure. Yeah, so this is, these are some of the processes. And I'm going to tell you now about pressure effects on, on, on some of these biomolecular systems, but a bit later. First, uh, let's do some um, more uh, basic uh, <laughs> recapitulations of pressure effects on chemical equilibria and uh, chemical reactions. So when you have a chemical reaction, so the pressure dependence of the <laughs> logarithm of the equilibrium constant, as, as you know already, is the volume change of the reaction minus delta V over RT, meaning that any equilibrium connected to a non-zero volume change will be shifted towards the more compact state, yeah, which is called the Le Chatelier principle. So volume changes control pressure-dependent chemical equilibria. One example, very <coughs> important example, our solvent is water, yeah, when water dissociates into proteins and OH minus and ions, and the reaction volume is minus 21 milliliters per mole. That means that the pH of our solution is shifted 0.3 units per kilobar. So we have a shift uh, or an increase of the dissociation of the water molecules. Or if you have a carboxyl group attached to a protein, yeah, so it, <laughs> increase of pressure will also lead to dissociation of, of the acid because the uh, reaction volume is negative. Yeah? So that's quite important. Regarding the kinetics, so the pressure dependence of the kinetic constant of a reaction is determined now by the activation volume, which is the difference between the volumes of the transition state and the volume of the initial state. Yeah? And, so if, and if the activation volume is negative, the reaction rate increases and vice versa. Yeah? And here, for example, you see bond formation, condensation of two amino acids forming a peptide bond. Yeah? And this is typically uh, involved with a negative <laughs> activation volume, so that leads to an acceleration of the reaction. Yeah? So typically, as chemists like to, to, uh, to describe, uh, chemical reactions. Uh, when you do temperature dependent studies, you plot the energy as a function of the reaction coordinate. Here you have your reactants A and B, you have your product AB, and here is the transition state, and, and uh, the kinetics is determined by the activation energy or the, or the activation enthalpy, to be more correct, and the difference in in uh, enthalpy between the product and, and the reactions is their reaction enthalpy. And when we do pressure dependent studies, we come up with, uh, with the volume diagram where we plot the partial molar volume as a function of the reaction coordinate. Here we have the reactants A and B, which react to some compound AB. And the difference is the reaction volume, delta V. <laughs> and we have now the, uh, the transition state lying here, AB star. And the activation volume forming uh, the product AB is controlled by the activation volume in the forward direction. This is this one. And in this case, uh, it is negative. But the activation, um, uh, the transition state uh, does not have to be uh, uh, on this side. It can also be on this side. Then we have a positive activation volume, which would lead to a retardation of the reaction. This one would lead to, a, to an acceleration of the reaction towards the product. Yeah? So this is how that works. I want to give you one example, a biological example, an enzyme reaction. An enzyme reaction <coughs> occurs in the following way. You have a protein, which is an enzyme, and you have a substrate, which might be a ligand or peptide. And they form a complex ES, 
enzyme substrate complex and <laughs> it's assumed in the michaelis menten kinetics that this is an equilibrium and we have the reaction rates k1 and k uh, uh, mi minus 1 in the forward and backward direction and this complex then dissociates then the reaction occurs with reaction constant k2 which is also called k cut for catalysis or turnover number this is the final reaction forming some product and this k cut as i said before is controlled by the activation volume of that process so how could this be measured um, typically these reactions in biosystems occur on the millisecond time scale so you can do this in a high pressure stop flow apparatus here you have a high, a high pressure system and then here you have two syringes inside one for example with the enzyme and this is, might be the substrate a small peptide yeah and then you mix them under particular pressure which occurs on the millisecond time scale okay and then the uh, 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 system evolves with time and then you analyze the product at some stage with some spectroscopy, UV visible or fluorescence here, yeah, and which is then recorded in the detector, and you measure the product formation as a function of time under these particular uh, pressure conditions. Yeah? I want to give you one example. This the enzyme was the, um, which I just showed you here, this one is alpha hemotrypsin, which uh, cleaves peptides. Yeah? And here, what is measured then is the absorbance of the product, yeah? And uh, as a function of time, when we increase the substrate concentration, well, the, the, the rate increases. And here you see for different temperatures when we increase the pressure. Here at ambient pressure, up to 2 kilobars. What you see here for this particular enzyme reaction, this one is accelerated under pressure. And of course, it's also accelerated when you increase the temperature. Yeah? So what you plot then is the slope yeah, of the reaction you plot this as a function of substrate concentration and then with some particular analysis what people do in enzyme kinetics when you know the enzyme concentration substrate concentration you can calculate these reaction constants which i mentioned before this one here the michaelis constant which is um, uh, <coughs> defined by these uh, reaction constants and you can determine the turnover number and you see here the Michaelis constant, which is actually inverse proportional to, to the um, uh, stability of, of form formation of enzyme substrate complex and the turnover number, they actually increase with pressure here for all the temperatures. Yeah? So by pressure and temperature, uh, you can, for this particular case, accelerate the enzyme reaction because the activation volume is negative. In this case, minus 2 milliliters per mole. And you can also, because you did the temperature dependent studies, you can also determine the activation volume for this cleavage of the peptide, which comes to 40 uh, kilojoule per mole. So doing this now as a function of temperature and pressure, you get a full thermodynamic and kinetic picture of a reaction. Yeah? And you see now in this example, when you do pressure and temperature, yeah, you can tune your biochemical reactions in particular ways. Yeah? Right, so this was um, just one example. I don't want to go in any detail regarding um, techniques. These biosystems are rather complicated. So what we like to do, we actually, actually try to apply almost all techniques which are accessible to get a full picture of the structure, conformation, dynamics of the system. And you heard about most of these uh, techniques already. I will mention two in a bit more details, you can thermodynamic measurements where you can measure uh, volume changes, expansion coefficient, compressibilities, volume fluctuations. You can do nuclear magnetic resonance, fluorescence, CD, for, uh, uh, infrared spectroscopy to, term, to determine conformational changes of peptides, proteins and lipids. You can do scattering experiments, X-ray, neutron, wide angle, small angle scatterings to determine the overall size and shapes of molecules like proteins in solution. And you can even do in these days atomic force microscopy. This one not under pressure, the only technique so far, but you can do high pressure fluorescence microscopy to look into the topology of phases. Yeah? 
So in principle, for all these techniques, uh, pressure cells are available, but for, let's say, 80% of them, you have to build them yourself still in these days. Now NMR is available commercially, but not this. But here we built, for example, a high-pressure neutron reflectivity cell. This is a high-pressure small angle scattering cell with flat diamond windows. This is a, um, um, a high-pressure fluorescence microscopy cell, which is essentially a, a quartz capillary. And uh, cert yeah, certainly uh, you can attach that also to some synchrotron, some high-pressure cell. This is a high-pressure cell for synchrotron, small angle scattering studies where you have flat diamonds. And uh, this is a diamond anvil cell. You heard about that already, and we use that also for the infrared spectroscopy. As pressure calibrant, we add, for example, barium sulfate or, or quartz, and we follow the phonon band of quartz as a function of pressure for pressure calibration. Yeah? Because our pressure range, as I said, is not extremely high, so these uh, techniques are available, or you can build them yourself. Regarding kinetic measurements, this is very important too. And what, what you typically do in chemical kinetics to measure the kinetics of a reaction, you typically do a temperature jump with a laser system in these days. Yeah? Or you can do a photochemical reaction to induce a reaction, or you change the concentration. For example, you add urea to unfold a protein. But we can also do a pressure jump. Yeah? And this actually occurs <coughs> uh, with a minimum. Uh, it's limited by the speed of sound, so, so we are limited to microseconds. But this is already quite fast. And this has a lot of advantages over temperature jump, because pressure propagates uniformly. Bidirectional, you can increase or decrease the pressure, and the final pressure is readily obtained. Yeah? So this is, has a big advantage. You just have to couple it, uh, couple it with a fast detection technique, which will be, for example, time-resolved small angle scattering or, or some, some, some spectroscopy, which are very fast. They have very fast detectors, too. Yeah? And I will give you an example for that. <laughs> now let's switch to some of the biosystems. So let's start off with the DNA. Yeah? So this is the phase diagram of the DNA polymer, pressure against temperature. Here we are in the double helical native state, which we know. And uh, uh, the <coughs> DNA can be melted at high temperature, but also at low temperature. And you see here, under ambi our ambient pressure conditions, nothing happens, even up to 10 kilobars. So our DNA is very, very stable. Uh, because it's very densely packed yeah? and, 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 and very strongly hydrated. There will be exception of that, but I will talk about that on, on Tuesday. Very different, our membranes are very pressure sensitive. Yeah? And that's probably the reason that, uh, that the pressure limitation for survival of organisms is limited to about 1-2 kilobars. And the question is, which we try to resolve now in the next minutes, uh, um, what does nature have to do uh, to um, adjust its membranes to survive extreme pressure conditions? Let's start off with an example. Here I show you the activity of an enzyme. We don't have to go into detail. That sodium potassium, ATPase, this is called. It transports sodium ions and potassium ions across our membrane system. Yeah? And what you see here, this is the activity of the enzyme. It decreases drastically up to about 2 kilobar reversibly and irreversibly after that. Yeah? So that could be now to a change of the structure of our membrane or the change of the structure of the protein. So it would be good advice to, to study both. And uh, we should start with a membrane. Our cellular membranes consists of lipid bilayers, yeah, attached like that, so they have two chains, but the, the length of the chains can vary, and also the head group structure can vary. Yeah? And each lipid has a specific phase transition temperature. It's, it's an ordered state where the hydrocarbon chains are highly ordered at low temperatures in some so-called gel phase, and it's disordered in some fluid-like state with high conformational order of the chains in the so-called fluid-like alpha state. Yeah? And here I show you for just 
uh, our membrane consists of many, many dozens, hundreds of different lipids, by the way. And here I show you the temperature water concentration phase diagram of a phospholipid consisting of, z of 16 hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon atoms in the chain. Yeah? So this is C16 and, and in both chains. And you see here in this thermogram, DSC, calorimetric thermogram, where you measure specific heat as a function of temperature, you see several peaks yeah, uh, reminiscent of phase transitions. And I will show you in a minute how you can measure the different structures of the membrane. And it turns out that at low temperatures, our chains are somehow ordered. That means they are very straight, yeah, but they can be bent and there might be some undulations. So these are all gel phases. And above some temperature in the L-alpha state, yeah, we have high conformational disorder of the chain. They, they can have kinks, they have can this double bonds and things like that. And, and nature requires our membranes have to be at least partially in such kind of fluid-like state. Otherwise, all the biochemical reactions in the membrane cannot occur. How would you measure that? By scattering experiments, small angle white and white angle scattering experiments, X-ray or neutron. Our lipid bilayers, when you put them into water, they form stacks, one-dimensional stacks. So they are actually reminiscent of one-dimensional crystals. Yeah, and that's the reason that in the small angle scattering area you measure laminar Bragg reflections. And from the Bragg equation, which you know, you can determine the repeat distance, which is actually this length, which is the lipid bilayer thickness, and then the water layer uh, around the head group area. And in the wide angle scattering area, you look from top to the membrane, so you see the head groups and you can determine like here, for example, for a hexagonal packing, the inter, uh, the, the spacing between the different lipid molecules. Yeah, and, and when you measure both, you can get information about the phase behavior of the membrane system. And here I show you the scattering pattern as a momentum of scattering angle or reciprocal spacing as a function of temperature in the small angle scattering region and here in the wide angle region. You see, in fact, phase transitions occur at different temperatures and you can do the same thing for uh, as a function of pressure and finally end up with a temperature pressure phase diagram of this system. And here I just want to show you part of the phase diagram. At low temperatures, as I said, we are in the gel phase of one of these gel phases, which is shown here. At high temperature, we are in the fluid-like state, which is of physiological relevance. So what does pressure do? Here I show you the phase diagram of our dipalmetoyl phosphatidylcholine. This is this C16 lipid bilayer system. And you see with increasing pressure, the phase transition temperature shifts to higher values. Yeah? So pressure increases the chain melting transition of the lipids. It's of course, as you expect, stabilizes the physiological irrelevant gel state because this has a smaller volume. So, and we actually did this for a lot of different phospholipid systems of different chain lengths and so on and so on. And uh, also for different degrees of saturation in the hydrocarbon chain. Now, assume that you are an organism living in the deep sea. That means you, have a, uh, you are at a temperature of 2 or 4 degrees centigrade. Pressure goes up to, to, to 1 kilobar. So to keep your membrane in a fluid-like state, what would you have to do? You would have to do, because here you are in the fluid-like like region here, you would have to introduce in your membrane this cis unsaturated phospholipids. Yeah, they have a cis double bond at 9, 10 position in the middle of the chain, which leads to some kink, so increases the disorder of the chain and makes the membrane more fluid-like. And this is actually has been observed uh, already a long time ago by McDonald and other that deep sea organisms, their membrane systems have a higher concentration of cis unsaturated phospholipid. So this is one mechanism of adaptation. Yeah? So, and there are other uh, mechanisms, but I don't want to talk about that. This is just, just in, uh, just to mention that here I show you the more complete phase diagram temperature pressure of this DPPC single 
lipid bilayer. This is just to, to let you know, as soon as you add something into the system, incorporate a membrane protein, like here, gramicidin, which is a, an iron transporter, you of course change the phase behavior, phase diagram, and you have to determine that. That's clear. Yeah? As soon as you add another compound, the ch phase behavior changes. Now let's switch to proteins. Uh, one of the most important uh, biomolecules, of course. So what does pressure uh, do to proteins? First an overview, and then we look into that into more detail. Well, this is a typical monomeric protein, staphylococcal nuclease, doesn't matter what it does. Uh, what can pressure do? It's typically rather densely packed. It can be compressed. Yeah? If this consists of different conformational substates, yeah, yeah, which... Uh, uh, have very similar structure, uh, pressure can populate excited states, which might be functional and relevant. It can, when it unfolds, pressure can, as you will see, pressure can unfold protein. Yeah, you, you can stabilize folding intermediates and detect them. If pressure is high enough, you can fully unfold protein. If you have multimeric protein, so protein clusters, they can dissociate and if you have aggregates, as you will see, pressure will lead to disaggregation of protein, which is of high biological relevance also. Just to remind you, so proteins consist of these 20 amino acids, which form this uh, primary structure. Then they can fold into secondary structures, alpha helices, beta sheets, yeah, this is the tertiary structure, and then more of these uh, monomeric units can uh, come together and form quaternary structures. Yeah. So let's look into the uh, simple monomeric protein. We do small angle scattering, and as you know, you can determine the overall size and shape of the molecule. And this is then the radius of duration, measured here, for example, as a function of temperature. And so you start off with 17 angstrom, it's the radius of duration, so, and you see uh, it unfolds the protein above about 43 degrees centigrade, yeah, and at higher temperatures it even aggregates. So you can easily detect that by small angle scattering, the size changes. Now do this as a function of pressure, now at ambient temperature, and you see we again start off at 17 angstrom, the native radius of duration of the protein, and you see at above two kilobars, the protein partially unfolds too. So obviously, pressure can disrupt protein, and for that protein here at two kilobar. The other technique I just want to mention here is the infrared spectroscopy. And here in this so-called amide one band region at around 1,600 1, centimeters to the minus one, you determine the CO stretching vibration, which is controlled by the hydrogen bonding pattern of the secondary structures. And they have all different hydrogen bonding patterns. And you can, in fact, decompose this amide one band region into alpha helices, beta sheet turns, coils, and so on. Yeah? And you see here, for example, as a function of temperature, the amide one band region, the alpha helix, beta sheet region, and with increasing temperature, yeah, so the, the, the ordered structures decrease and the disordered increase. And you see here now at ambient temperature as a function of pressure, essentially the same thing occurs. Yeah? So you can obviously unfold the protein, and here shown for the unfolding of secondary structures, alpha helix, beta sheet under pressure, yeah, and you can measure without going into detail as a function of temperature and pressure, the alpha helix content, beta sheet content, and concomitantly the disordered structure when the protein unfolds. Then you can determine the, uh, the, the chips free energy change of unfolding, which is here 16 kilojoule per mole, and the volume change of unfolding, which of course must be negative, otherwise the protein would not unfold under pressure, minus 80 milliliters per mole. So, and you end up then with this typical pressure temperature phase diagram of a protein. Here we are in the native state, yeah, so it's partially elliptic. So you can, and here in the denatured state, unfolded state. So you can unfold the protein in the heat, by the way, also in the cold, which means cold denaturation, and here at ambient temperatures by pressure. This is what we observed right now. 
And of course, I mean, in, in biophysics, you, you, you might want to try to, to describe the theoretically. So the chips free energy of unfolding, which is the, 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 the free energy of the unfolded state minus the native state, can be expanded without going into detail within some approximation into different components. And if you want to determine that, you have to measure the change in compressibility, change in expansion coefficient, change in, in, in heat capacity, change in volume, and change in entropy upon unfolding. And we actually measure that for one protein. And what you then get is delta G as a function of temperature and pressure. And when delta G is equal to zero, then you are in equilibrium. And then you get the pressure temperature coexistence curve for the unfolding transition from native to denature. Yeah? So in, in particular cases, you are lucky and you can even describe that theoretically. This is just to mention that as soon as we have oligomers, yeah, then you need rather low pressures to, 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 to stabilize oligomeric structures. One of our most important enzymes is our alcohol dehydrogenase, yeah? and, uh, which is actually a dimer. Yeah? And the dimer dissociates already at pressures of a few hundred bars. Yeah? So this is very important that the oligomers are much more pressure sensitive than the monomeric proteins. Now let's come to the important question. What is the reason for pressure-induced unfolding? Let's start off with the most important contribution. This is the last one. Yeah? Proteins contain uh, ca ca cavities, yeah? void volume, typically 1 to 2% um, percent void volume, which, which are unoccupied, so essentially underwater. And of course, when the protein unfolds, yeah, this void volume will be filled with water. So the overall volume change will be negative. Yeah? So this is the largest contribution, loss of cavities and void volume as major driving force. There are also other driving forces, electrostriction. Yeah? When we have iron pairs and the protein unfolds, the iron pairs get uh, uh, um, uh, dissociated and hydrated. And the hydration shell is rather, rather dense, yeah? which leads to an overall volume decrease as well which is called electrostriction. So these two are the major driving forces. But of course, also if you expose polar residues, there will be a, a slight volume decrease. Hydrophobic hydration is not really clear. At least the effect will be rather small. And pressure also leads, according to theoretical calculations, uh, to a stabilization of hydrophobic interaction. So hydrophobic molecules will, like methane, which are in contact, will dissociate under pressure. So this is another contribution. Yeah, but these, are, these two are the most important ones. Let's skip that. So far we did experiments just in, in the beaker, right? but when you look into our cell, and this is a rather uh, reasonable view into the interior of our cell. It's an extremely crowded place. Yeah? We do not even have water. I mean, we have a complex co-solvent mixture. Where there must be strong intermolecular interactions. There are strong confinement conditions. Next to macromolecular crowding, the, the dynamics will change too. And in addition, we will have uh, what we are interested in, in extremes of temperature and pressure. So in principle, we would have to look into all these particular properties as well to understand what's, what's the effect of temperature and pressure on, on, on the cell. And I don't have time to go into that here. Just one example. There's the change of unfolding pressure as a function of concentration when we add some co-solvents. Our cells, for example, have a lot of sugars, glycerol, so so-called compatible osmolites. And you see when you add them, these are uh, glycerol, sorbitol, sucrose. Yeah, we have them in our cells too. The unfolding pressure increases dramatically, even up one, two kilobar. Whereas other compounds like urea, a waste product, which we have too, yeah, leads to uh, the opposite effect. So, so by changing the, the osmolite concentration, yeah, the stability of proteins can be tuned too. As I said, we can also do kinetic studies. Now, let's do the unfolding of a protein very rapidly. 
Yeah, in a pressure jump experiment, so we measure radius of gyration, when we unfold the protein, so a very fast pressure jump here, and measure the radius of gyration as a function of time. And you see, this is a rather slow process, the un pressure induced unfolding of a protein. You can simulate the curve and you get the, the, the unfolding time, actually 500 seconds, that's, that's very long. And you can do the opposite, you can do <coughs> the uh, refolding at different pressures, and then you finally end up, as I said, with a volume diagram. Here we are in the folded state, and here we are in the unfolded state. Yeah, and we can determine from these kinetic curves also the activation volume for, for unfolding, which is minus 20 milliliters per mole. And if we start off in the unfolded state and refold the protein, the activation volume for folding is, uh, above, uh, uh, is about 60 milliliters per mole and positive, meaning that pressure and used folding of protein is drastically slowed down. And that's the reason yeah, that it's not occurring on milli and microsecond time scales as usually protein unfold, uh, folding occurs. It's occurring on the, on, even on the minute time scale. And so using pressure uh, jump kinetics, you can <coughs> drastically slow down the folding kinetics and study the folding process more thoroughly. So, so this has also an advantage. And of course, you get information about the transition state. And the, in our case, as you see here, it's rather close to the folded state. So the transition state of the folding process is already largely dehydrated. It's very similar to the folded state. Yeah, so you can do that. Okay, in the last maybe two, three minutes, just, just to mention that the dark side of protein folding is, is protein aggregation and fibril formation. Yeah? And this, of course, uh, occurs in nature too. Yeah? This is uh, the reason for all these so-called conformational diseases like Alzheimer, BSE, diabetes mellitus 2, and so on. They are based on the deposition of protein aggregates, which we call amyloid. And this, of course, after failure of the quality control of your cell, which, of course, as you know, uh, increases uh, dramatically with age. So it occurs in the following way. You have a protein which might be partially unfolded due to some particular interactions or mutations. And then this partially folded state might nucleate from uh, um, uh, small oligomers, and yeah, which they even can grow. They form... Uh, beta sheet uh, protofilaments, and you can see them in the atomic force microscopy. They form fibrils, yeah, and and these fibrillar deposits are the reason for these diseases. Uh, just one example: insulin, partially unfolded, can lead to these these propagating boss beta sheet structures, very long micrometer long fibrils. Yeah? And here I just want to show you what pressure does. So pressure can be used to understand these processes as well. Um, here I show you just light scattering experiments or here TUV flavine fluorescence. TUV flavine is a fluorescence marker of fibrils as a function of time at ambient pressure. You can also do small angle scattering and then you can follow the formation of the fibrils here with time. Now, you see, when you increase pressure, almost nothing happens. But a bit happens still. Yeah? Uh, fibrils are formed which have very different structures. They have bent structures. So, so they are of obviously different folding pathways and uh, or different uh, aggregation pathways, yeah, and, and pressure is able to populate that one with the smallest delta V. Yeah? So it gives hint for the polymorphism of fibrillar states. So it completes our picture about the uh, fibril formation and protein aggregation process. And I think time is up, yeah? Okay, just to summarize, yeah? And uh, so I hope I could show you the pressure acts on the structure and dynamics of biomolecular systems through changes in volume. And these changes in volume are largely due to hydration and packing effects. Yeah? Then I hope I could show you pressure is uniquely well suited for, for studying the solvation, enfolding, dynamics and interactions of proteins with biomolecules. By pressure, you can change intermolecular interactions. You foster hydrogen bonding. Yeah, you, uh, <coughs> yeah, you disfavor electrostatic and hydrophobic interactions. So by pressure changes, you can modulate the interaction parameters. 
Then I showed you that pressure-dependent experiments can help characterize enfolding processes, disentangle aggregation pathways, uh, uncover intermediate states, and so on. And of course, there are applications of pressure in biotechnology, steering enzymatic reactions, high-pressure food processing, and you will hear more about that. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, if I understood you right, the, the essential condition to ex for acceleration of reaction is that the volume of intermediate states should be smaller than the volume of the gradient. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. This is what I said. Um, just going back briefly, because the last step is responsible for the reaction. Yeah. Uh, Let's see where it is. Okay. Yeah, should be here. So uh, the last step is responsible for the reaction, right? And it's determined by the activation volume, which will be, that's probably the, your question, the, the difference of the volume between the transition state, which is lying somewhere, here and the volume of the ES complex. Yeah, so that, that's probably your question. This volume difference determines the reaction rate. But of course, the, all these constants are also determined by that. So pressure effects, I, I didn't want to make it too complex. Pressure, of course, may, might affect the enzyme, structure dynamics, substrate, co solvent density as well. Yeah, so this will affect this one. But the, the final step, the catalysis rate, will be determined by the volume difference between uh, the, the transition state and the ES complex. Yeah. But if we apply the pressure, we'll change the volume to the both simultaneously. And I mean that, you told that applying the pressure, we may, uh, may change the speed, we may change the uh, rate constant. But Sure, you change everything at the same time, and if the and in, in yeah and 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 if pressure is too high, then of course you unfold the enzyme, and this of course will be an effect on the catalysis rate too, yeah. So so in fact, yeah, you affect the other things as well, yeah. Which finally show up then in the. In, in the population and the number of ES complexes, which determines then also K2. Yeah. It's a kind of Lindemann molecular mechanism. Lindemann mole molecular uh, mechanism. Uh, what the mechanism will yeah. be? Yeah. yeah, the, the mechanism. yeah. You, uh, you go to the, to the next slide. Yeah. And you have, no, the next one. Yeah, yeah. 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 This expression there. Yeah. And. Um, so what you determine is the velocity, you know this one, and then you can determine the constants if you plot that as a function of substrate concentration. Yeah? And then you can determine uh, um, the reaction constant and the pressure effect on the, on the initial, on the equilibrium. That's prob probably part of your question. Yeah? Um, uh, yeah, the formation of the enzyme substrate complex, and this yeah, uh, is given by the Michaelis constant. And all these pressure effects on these other rates uh, are reflected in there. Okay. There are no more questions? Thanks again. Sure. Uh,